Welcome to the closing event of the 2020 edition of the Belfast International Arts Festival. We are delighted you could join us. My name is Richard Wakeley and I am the festival's artistic director and chief executive. All of us at the festival hope that this year we have managed to play our part in demonstrating through this online edition how culture has the power to bring people, places and nations together and enrich the lives of all citizens. I'm therefore grateful to all the artists who have made the effort to adapt their practice for this digital edition of the festival. And to all of you out there for joining us online. In this time of genuine financial hardship for the arts, we're particularly grateful to those of you who have made donations to the festival. Finally, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the board and staff of the festival, as well as our funders for rising to the challenge and supporting this the 58th edition of the Belfast Festival. Over the last three weeks, we've hosted artists and events that have reflected on the state of the world around us. And many of these events are still available to view on our, in our online library. Just go to our website at www.belfastinternationalartsfestival.com to revisit many wonderful and inspiring moments from this year's programme. And keep an eye on our website for more festival events in the coming months, including a special concert by the Ulster Orchestra on the 5th of December and a series of, a series of recitals on BBC Radio 3 in January. Now, lest we forget, COVID-19 is not the only serious challenge that the world is currently facing. The US faces an epic choice on the 3rd of November, and the result will have global repercussions for democracy, progress and unity for generations. Transatlantic ties, superpower relations and the climate emergency are all in the balance. Abortion, healthcare access, gender equality and racial justice in the US are at risk. Issues that disproportionately impact the lives of women, minorities and those on lower incomes. To help us better understand how we've arrived at this crucial point in US and global history and what might happen after the 3rd of November, we are closing this year's festival with this very special live stream talk. And I can't think of a better panel of speakers and experts to discuss the background to this most extraordinary of US presidential elections. We're honored and delighted to have Irish Times columnist Fintan O'Toole returning to the festival to host a conversation with Professor Sarah Churchwell and Dr. Michelle Cressfield, two leading British American experts on US history, civil rights and politics. And you too can join in the conversation by posting questions and observations in the online chat room. So for more information on all our events, to sign up for our newsletter or to make a donation, please visit our website www.belfastinternationalartsfestival.com. Thank you for joining us this evening and enjoy the conversation. Now, over to you, Fintan. Thank you very much, Richard, and, and uh, thanks indeed to everybody involved in the Belfast International Arts Festival for uh, keeping the flame uh, lit of, of uh, one of the great festivals on these islands. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's always been a, a huge pleasure to, to take part in it, um, and, and it's, uh, it's particularly important this year, I think, um, that uh, we all as, as participants, but also as 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 audience members um support our festival support our artists support our writers and um the, the this this the festival as it's as it's played out um has been a, a, a wonderful example of why that is um, um i suppose this evening we're going to address uh, a certain kind of paradox in a way which is that uh, most people would agree that over the last four years the prestige of the United States as the world's indispensable power um, has been seriously eroded um, by the strangeness of the Trump presidency, um, by the United States pulling out of international commitments, most, most notably the, uh, the Paris Climate Change Accords, uh, and particularly by the inability of the richest, most powerful, most, most scientifically endowed country on earth to protect its citizens. Um, in the coronavirus crisis. And yet, uh, the importance of the US in world's eyes has not diminished to the extent that uh, those eyes are not fixed very much on what's happening in the United States uh, and what's particularly going to happen on, on Tuesday and in the days that will, that will follow. Um, 
pretty much everybody in pretty much every part of the globe remains aware of the crucial role that this election is going to play uh, for all of us. I mean, obviously, particularly for US citizens, um, but it's important in Ireland, it's important to Britain, um, it's important for everybody around the world. And it's a real uh, honor to, to, to be here this evening with two absolutely brilliant historians of the modern United States. Um, uh, Richard has briefly introduced them. I'll, I'll just uh, do it slightly less briefly. Uh, so Sarah Churchwell is Professor of American Literature and of the Public Understanding of the Humanities at University College London. Um, the most recent of her four superb books, and I, I would really very strongly recommend it, is Behold America, uh, which explores the history of white nationalism in America, including the racist history of the phrase that, of course, Donald Trump um, has has used so potently, America first. And Michelle Cressfield uh, grew up in, in Alabama and New York um, and has lived in the other Birmingham, Birmingham, England, in uh, uh, since, since 2017. Uh, she's a lecturer in United States history at the University of Birmingham, uh, where she teaches on subjects including American history from 1890 to 2000. Uh, focusing in particular on gender and sexuality, on racial identity, and on social justice in America. Um, so I'm going to start by just putting a question to you both in turn. Um, and it's from, I was just trying to think about what kind of parallels might we draw from American elections uh, in terms of the sense of epochal importance, an election that might shape the, the future direction of the United States. And two, Michelle, particularly came to mind. Um, one is Abraham Lincoln's re-election in 1864, uh, while the Civil War was still on. And while if Lincoln had lost to the Democrats, it probably would have been an end to the Civil War on terms favorable to the South. Um, and the other one that struck me was Richard Nixon's very narrow um, defeat of Hubert Humphrey in 1968, um, which in many ways kind of shaped modern American conservatism. Uh, do you think, Michelle, that those parallels are, are accurate? And if so, what do they tell us about the current moment? Yeah, so I think it is a really um, interesting um, parallels that we can draw from both of those elections, both of them coming on the hills of great upheavals, um, the loss of life, the kinds of um, the, the, the kinds of instability of the U.S. in both of those moments, I think it's really relevant to our kind of current moment, thinking about COVID, thinking about the racial reckonings of the summer. And so both of both of those early elections, I think, share with with now this um, this kind of um, unsureness about kind of where to go forth and in a kind of quest for stability. And I think in terms of thinking ideologically, in terms of shifts, right, this is a referendum on, on Trump, right, we might think as this election, but it's also a referendum on all of the things that Americans tell themselves about what America is supposed to be. Right. So it's also a, a referendum about democracy. It's a referendum about um, kind of what we think is kind of like human rights and civility. Like all of that is at stake, not to mention, the, you know, all the you know important policy issues and, and things that you've been writing about, Fenton. Um, and so I think in, in terms of thinking about a shift and we're still, you know, not kind of sure what that shift is going to look like. But I think that there's a lot there. Can I put the same question to you, Sarah? Do, do you think those parallels are illuminating in any way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would echo what Michelle said, and 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 because in in the sense of they're being consequential um, in that way. But I I will say actually that I'm gonna I'm probably gonna keep uh, um, making the case for this actually being uh, uniquely consequential. Um, and the uh, and and I'll, I'll add actually one er, even earlier consequential election, which will illustrate my point, which was George Washington's historic decision not to seek a third term and to step down in 1796 in order to establish a peaceful transfer of power and to embed the idea that the presidency was not a monarchy. And from 1796 until today, there has never been a president or a presidential candidate who has not committed to a peaceful transfer of power and to accepting the outcome of the vote. And this is the first time that we have a president and his followers 
saying that they may not accept the outcome, a certified outcome. Now, there are different arguments that we'll get to about people saying maybe it's cheating and maybe it's not going to be a, a, a clean and clear outcome. But Trump wouldn't even commit to a peaceful transfer of power if everybody agreed that he'd lost. I don't think you can say that there's a more consequential election, therefore. But I will also throw in one more, um, which is 2000. And we might think that that wasn't as consequential as um, things like a civil war in 1864. Uh, but the course of history over the last 20 years was very much shaped by the Bush presidency, as everybody listening to this knows, when we imagine what a Gore presidency might have done in relation not only to international uh, relations, but also, of course, to climate change. Um, we're looking at a very different world. And the other thing I would say about the 2000 election that is very pertinent to right now, that I think not enough European uh, um, uh, uh, people are aware of in, in, in the conversations that I've been having recently is that both uh, Am Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh worked on the Republican side of the campaign to stop the recount in Florida to put to get Bush into office. So there is a clear trajectory there. And in terms of the ideology that Michelle was talking about and the ways in which we are facing a referendum on how American democracy is supposed to work, we can definitely see massive changes in just the last 20 years. And that's really what's coming to a head on Tuesday. Um, and, and we'll see uh, whether we can uh, change that course or whether we are irrevocably still heading in that, or not, maybe not irrevocably forever, but for the foreseeable future, still heading in that direction. Yes. Um, Michelle, it, it, it strikes me that, and this is a bit crude, but there are essentially two ways of, of understanding the Trump presidency. And one of these is one that actually Joe Biden more or less explicitly appeals to, right? Which is to say, this is just an, it's an aberration. That's not who we are. It's, 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 it's a kind of freak event that has occurred. Um, and if you just elect me, we, we return to the American norm. And the implication being that the American norm is one in which uh, you have a very well-functioning democracy in which everybody gets to vote and in which all the voices are heard. The other way of seeing it is, is to say, uh, you don't get a Trump. You know, Trump is not possible uh, in a well-functioning democracy. And perhaps that what Trump arises to, 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 to bring to the fore is, is the original sin of the creation of the United States. You know, this, this complete disjunction between the wonderful ideas of a Republican democracy of equals on the one side, and on the other side, the specific overwhelming reality of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could say that actually Trump is not an aberration. He's a he's a, he's an expression of that original sin. Yeah. So I I think that's a um, you put it really really beautifully really really perfectly. Um, so I've talked about this in in, in different um, venues, but I I'm actually teaching the 1619 project um, currently at university, which is a project that really takes that kind of ladder articulation that you make, Fenton, and that this kind of idea of American democracy is very much wedded to also versions of inequality and exploitation of Black bodies, of, of minorities, and that we've not really reconciled that. And I think I'm very much of that mindset. Um, I think that in many instances, some of our biggest ideals, and you also have minorities who have also bought into this idea of democracy in the American dream, um, that you know that Sarah's written so beautifully about as the, the the best articulation of what we could be, right? And so I think that is laudable and it's important, and that that's what you know um, the country is striving towards. But I think, especially too, in, in some of our most celebratory moments, thinking about the aftermath of the Obama election, right? We thought we'd gotten there. And then having to to have that kind of really jarring realization because, you know, Trayvon Martin, um, Michael Brown occur in the Obama um, and the after math of that huge moment that our kind of racial reckoning, th th that kind of um, reconciliation that was supposed to happen, you know, through the Voting Rights Act of 65 or through Obama, like we've not really gotten there. And so I agree with you, this this kind of Trump is an articulation of really a lot of undone work that America has not done in, in trying to reconcile some essential parts of itself. Uh, uh, can I just follow up on that? Uh, uh, 
to me, and it's probably not a controversial point, but the greatest political leader of the 20th century is Martin Luther King. But King strategically decided that he wasn't going to criticize the American Constitution. He was going to, you know, to, to, to occupy it, as it were, say, OK, this is the Constitution. This is what it says. That's what I want. And it, it, in its moment, you know, ar arguably a brilliant strategic choice because it allowed him to to, to co-opt the Constitution onto the side of civil rights. But there were also other black leaders who were saying, no, you know, this is this is sort of accepting the validity of something that was always tainted. Uh, and you could argue, and I'd love to hear what you think about this, that although King's choice at the time was absolutely right, it, it, it contained within it this problem that it, 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 it's very difficult in the mainstream still in America to say, actually, we have original problems. You know, There are problems which are sort of really implicit in the Constitution. Does that make sense as a way of thinking about things? Yes, I think that's really important. And I think, you know, oftentimes when people think of King, they think of him as the, the orator, they think of him as the reverend, the moral leader. And he absolutely was that. But he was also one of the most um, brilliant political strategists. So this idea of nonviolent protest, this idea of being very particular about the parts of um, the kind of American system that he would critique that was very deliberate in terms of allowing him to ensure a base, but also to the, the movements of people like Malcolm X of armed deacons in Mississippi allowed him to see to seem like the safer alternative um, in terms of a, a vision of America. Um, but I think that what's important um, there as well in that when he does there are there are moments um, and, and kind of King's rhetoric um, where he's not necessarily implicating the Constitution, which, right, and as I'm sure you both know, you know, kind of protects slavery without mentioning it, right? So that, that when you think about that original sin, it's right there in our kind of one of our most important founding documents um, in terms of the work that it doesn't do. Um, but he does, I think, very much imply that there is a weakness in American democracy if it can't live up to recognizing the kind of fundamental rights of all of its citizens and so so i so i agree with you that they, that it does um his critiques are are open to interpretation in a way that kind of opens up these these kinds of um I, for instance it's it, it amazes me how people on the right love king like the way in which he's celebrated. And if you think about what he stood for, he's not supposed to be the, the kind of figure of a kind of like modern post-racial conservatism. And, and he's kind of been co-opted into that. And so I think there's a way in which we kind of misremember him as, as a person and, and kind of some of the work that he does. And Sarah, I mean, you know, you write so brilliantly in your, in your recent book about about this, this, the history of America first. I mean, of that, of, of nativism, which is, of course, ironically not native. <laughs> it doesn't include Native Americans. It doesn't include the 1619 slaves who were brought in. But it, you know that that idea of an indigenous white America, which is is sort of continually threatened by by the other, and therefore has to sort of re reassert itself all the time. E even and I, I, what I found fascinating about your book is that it, it sort of illuminates that, that even at times when there were very few threats to white supremacy in America. You know, th this this narrative was 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 nonetheless um, very very a, a very potent political one. Yeah, um, I think that's absolutely right. And the, as you say, the the word nativism at first sounds confusing um, uh, to modern ears, but the but what it meant was native born. They meant native born white American, and the word um, developed in the 1840s and 1850s, actually around the in reaction to the immigration of German and Irish Americans. And so it was an explicitly anti-immigrant uh, way of framing um, native born Americans versus non-native born Americans. And the reason why that timing matters is because it didn't need to think about native Americans or indeed African Americans at that point because they were both explicitly disbarred from citizenship by the constitution at that time. So for, for to all intents and purposes for the political conversation at that moment because those groups were not citizens 
there was no argument over whether they were American. They were explicitly not American because they were not full citizens under the law. Um, and so the, the, the implications of that rhetoric are actually, um, it sounds like the wrong word, it's actually kind of exactly the right word because it, it brings home the fact that, they o that only white people counted and they simply didn't think about anybody else. Um, and then the arguments were about native born Americans at first versus um, immigrant communities. And then as that debate fused with the rise of scientific racism globally, not just in the United States, of course, but also in Britain and in Northern Europe, um, the ways in which then that argument became uh, um, deeply uh, um, and explicitly linked to arguments about white supremacy and the way that white supremacy was supposed to justify all of the expansionist and imperialist programs of the 19th century. So it justified the British Empire and it justified the Monroe Doctrine in America and Manifest Destiny and all of the different kinds of expansionist um, programs there. And it was kind of in that period as those rhetorics were joining forces, if you like, um, that they started to articulate this idea of America first. And at that point, American um, economic power was starting to grow. So when, when Trump started using it, a lot of journalists said that it was a phrase that, that was worrying because it began in the 1940s with Charles Lindbergh. And what I do in the book is show that, that at all intents and purposes, it ended with Charles Lindbergh until Trump uh, revived it. And that it actually, the earliest iterations I found are from the 1880s. There are probably earlier ones, but um, I haven't yet identified them, but it but it wasn't a national slogan at that point. It became a national slogan under Wilson in an explicitly anti-immigration um, nativist context at a time when immigration had been absolutely exploding. So at this point, America was starting to see Southern European um, immigration. And that was, again, you know, joining forces, converging with all of the scientific racist eugenicist argument that Northern Europeans were, uh, you know, biologically superior to people from um, well, basically everywhere else in the world, right? And so it's exactly at this point um, in 1915 when America first became popularized and then going into the early 1920s that in the United States, um, the second Ku Klux Klan uh, um, kicked off um, lit a fire and declared itself reborn and then it adopted this phrase america first so it pulled in these nativist um ideas with explicitly um uh, racist ideas with explicitly white supremacist ideas and it's no coincidence that that was happening at the same time that these ideals were also being articulated in uh, Europe in the nascent fascist movements, which were making very similar arguments about German for the Germans, uh, Spain for the Spanish, Italy for Italians, and in the United States, it was America first. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I suppose, uh, parochially, uh, I've been very interested in the history of Irish America, you know, and it's, it's, it's an interesting test case in a way, because it, it seems to suggest that w when you have structural racism and, and you have uh, the the slaves and their descendants be, being vi violently suppressed as a permanent underclass. There's two things then that sort of white immigrants who are who are not native, for, you know, can do. They can either side with that and say, you know, th there's a fundamental injustice in this society which which needs to be rectified. We need a an actual republic of equals. But there's also a very tempting other route, which is to say, but look, we're white. We're, we're, we're not like them. Uh, and, and you shouldn't be discriminating against us because we're, we're, we're after all, we're, we're white people. Uh, and you see both of these things very, very powerfully in, in the history of Irish America. And it's particularly interesting now because you have Biden, who identifies very much with one Irish American tradition, you know, which is the one that comes down through through Bobby Kennedy, you know, and, and, and you know, do, do, does try to do the first of those, and however imperfectly. Um, but you also have a lot of Irish Americans around Trump, you know, who, 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 who go the second route, essentially, and say, yeah, but the Irish suffering is, is different. You know, we, we look, look at us, it's, it's used very much as a, as, as a kind of racist um, uh, w w w form of argument, which is to say, well, the Irish suffer just as much as the blacks, but we, we don't, we're not complaining. We're, we're not looking for reparations. We're, uh, we, you know, we, we, we got on in life. So you, you can see how these embedded choices that were there in the 19th century are, st are still working their way out. I don't know if that's coming to, to me or to, yes, um, to you, Sarah, sorry. To, to Michelle. Yeah. Um, so, no, absolutely. And um, I also ha have some Irish American heritage. My 
father strongly identifies as Irish American. So this is all kind of very familiar to me as well on the, the kind of Biden side. But absolutely. And, and I think that the, the, the complexities of the ways in which assimilation worked in a highly raced context um, basically, what happened was that in this, you know, deeply racialized 19th century context in particular and into the turn of the 20th century, where, as I say, I mean, literally your citizenship stood or fell on whether you were white or black. Um, you had no access to uh, any kind of citizenship before 1863 if you were uh, if you were deemed non-white. So the, the, it wasn't just a rhetorical move. It was actually uh, it was a it was a deeply important political move. You had to establish your whiteness um, to have any rights and to be able to have property and to not be enslaved. I mean, to literally not be enslaved. And of course, what happened. As, um, as as you both know, and as, uh, as as I'm sure many people in the audience know as well, and it's we could do a whole thing on the way in which the Black Irish were troped in America at the turn of the night or the latter half of the 19th century, and there were uh, um, and and this is widely available on the internet. Um, there's a, you know and there've been wonderful wonderful books written about it by scholars like Hazel Carby that that the um, that that Irish immigrants were literally depicted as Africans. Um, in the anti-immigrant, uh, um, you know, propaganda against them. But you also see, and, and I'll, I'll just mention another one to say that, yes, you, that you can see the way the Irish, very, as you say, various constituencies within Irish immigrants would try to position themselves in the ways that they could. But there's a, a, an analogous but different um, uh, com complex story about assimilation with uh, Jews, for example, because similarly Jews were on the one hand, compared to Protestant native born Americans, very much othered. On the other hand, um, when they were found themselves in a binarized, uh, um, you know, race racialized system where it was if you're not black, you're white, then in that binary, they would go, well, we're clearly white in this scenario. And there was a, a particularly with Jews who settled in the South, there was an enormous amount of complexity around that. I mean, the the most famous examples being the, the Lehmans, um, who had set up, of course, Lehman Brothers Bank, and they were slaveholders, um, and they were deeply embedded in the slave system. And you kind of, you know, and, there, and that raises all, you know, incredibly complicated um, um, questions. I think that each each group found itself. Uh, um, I, I sometimes because I think I think in terms of rhetoric and codes and the way that language helps people position themselves, and I sometimes think that except that American ideas of exceptionalism, um, as as closely and carefully scrutinized as they have been, we've kind of missed a trick in not in not noticing the ways in which or or that there's more to be said anyway about the ways in which any group could come in and then kind of um, find that exceptionalist paradigm and claim it for themselves because it's an active paradigm that works as a claiming of power in the American, um, you know, uh, cultural discourse. And certainly Irish Americans did that and, as you say, continue to do that. Yeah. Um, Michelle, the, 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 the phrase, it's a cliched phrase, but it, it keeps coming back to my mind anyway, which is, is unfinished business. You know, the, the, the inability of the United States to process its own history you know, to actually, it's not linear. It just, it, it, it can't seem to go and say, we had a civil war about slavery. You know, <laughs> there was an emancipation proclamation. It was absolutely, I mean, horrendous one at, at, at enormous costs to black people themselves who revolted, one at enormous cost of civil war. And then we have reconstruction and then Jim Crow, you know, <laughs> uh, and then almost a repeat of that in, in some ways in the 1960s, you know, where you have, the incredible sacrifices of, 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 of the civil rights movement and in one way victory with the Civil Rights Act, with the Voting Rights Act, um, but then also in a way defeat, you know, that, that Nixon can still come in in 1968 and say, you know, we're we're operating a southern strategy here where you know we're we're using not particularly coded racist messages to say we're going to detach the south from the democrats we're going to get white voters into a politics of resentment uh, and you see this with, i mean trump is is still able to play this stuff he's using in many ways a lot, lot of the, trying to use the very same phrases silent majority law and order you know um, these black people coming into this into, into your suburbs if 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 Biden's elected, why is it that the United States is not capable of you know having some linear sense of progress in terms of what after all is one of the most basic propositions of a democracy 
which is that everybody's equal. I think it has a lot to do with um, misremembering. Some of it is intentional. Uh, some of it is the result of um, um, just what it takes to just try to reconcile itself in terms of these laudable principles, right? So one of the things um, about kind of this idea of American democracy, right? You have people who are defenders of that on the left and the right. And so there are certain segments of the liberal left who are uncomfortable with a kind of like radical BLM critique of the US because that it, it, it jars some of the ways in which they feel about themselves. Um, I think, you know, thinking about the aftermath of the Civil War, one of the, 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 the Civil War ends up being about slavery, but when the union enters, they think it's, it's a, they see it more as a preservation of the union. It's not until they're in the war and they see how much slavery is tethered to the preservation of the Union that they become very much on that side. And then when the war is over, we get Reconstruction. But by that time, the, the radical Republicans are fatigued and they want the Union to kind of be reconciled, which then necessitates a misremembering about what the war was about to begin with. Right. And we have throughout history people buying into this misremembering of what actually has been happening. And so it makes it very hard to parse through the principles um, of, of what it is that we're standing for if no one's really clear about what was at stake um, in, in many instances. And I think, you know, we call the, the civil rights movement the second reconstruction. Um, but I think one of the interesting things, just to bring it back to the present, which makes this really important in thinking about this unfinished business. If you look at some of the critiques from BLM, some of the things that they're calling for, which is around kind of um, economic um, redistribution, around thinking about systems of power, this is very much a kind of agenda that's born of the lessons of the past. Because one of the biggest critiques with, of King, right, was that he abandoned this kind of economic redistribution in favor of a kind of legalistic civil rights agenda and that that was something lost in that. And again, with the radical Republicans and not seeking kind of more uh, a kind of fully aggressive platform. And so I think it's really interesting um, to think about that um, in, in terms of what BLM and, and, and two, something like defund the police would be unheard of several months ago. That's now mainstream. That is, and not just kind of divesting resources from the police, but thinking about the other places in which those, that, those resources can go. And so I, I definitely think you we have now with us scholars who, and, and I'm sorry, activists who are attuned to that kind of unfinished business and trying to be very clear in our present moment about what's at stake. Um, Sarah, what, what, one issue that one might say it is unique this time, right? So, so even if we use those parallels from the past, it, it seems to me, and I'd, I'd like to know what you think of this, that what's different this time is the dimension of gender being so upfront and not just gender, but masculinity, you know, the, the Trump's, you know, uh, public persona as a sexual predator, his, his, his open misogyny, you know, the fact that he, he even last week we see he can't stop himself from being misogynistic towards his own female candidates at rallies, you know. So, Sarah, how, how much does gender play into this election in a different way? And, and what are its implications for, for Tuesday? It's a really, really important question. I mean, as we're saying, it's a referendum on American democracy, um, but it's also a referendum on American patriarchy to a great extent. And um, and the whole Trump um, presidency has been, of course, Trump won in 2016 because white women pushed him over the line. And for uh, white women like me who did not want him to get over the line, um, that was uh, a, a great well, was a personal betrayal uh, that I had to come to terms with um, and, and to reckon with and that I've had a lot of um, uh, conversations around. And now everybody has seen in this election how Trump is uh, deliberately trying to get back the white suburban women vote that he is losing in droves. Um, and it turns out that the pandemic has not, that the white suburban women have not been a fan of the pandemic. Um, and, but also then the, um, the very, very contested uh, um, Supreme Court uh, uh, um, confirmations, obviously Kavanaugh, 
um, at, which was, you know, a highly triggering event for a lot of American women, uh, deeply, deeply personal for women who had been abused and uh, um, and suffered sexual assault in various ways. And, and also it suffered denialism, right? I mean, Michelle was talking about the denialism um, in regards to slavery and in, and in regards to racial problems in America, but there's also deep-seated denialism in regards to uh, uh, American women's um, blocked roots to power and how embedded white governance is in structures of patriarchy. Um, and we haven't yet mentioned, but it's actually incredibly important uh, to Trump's support, um, and it's uh, embodied by his vice president, is the role of Christian evangelicalism in the, the uh, American right today. Um, and Amy Coney Barrett is a perfect example of that, a woman who served as a handmaid. Um, I mean, you couldn't get, as I said, I'm attuned to language. I mean, you couldn't get anything more symbolic where she's literally made herself a handmaid to patriarchy and they reward her by putting her on the court. And of course, she says that she's an originalist, um, that she doesn't want to bring in any meanings that wouldn't be in the Constitution. Well, the Constitution didn't think she was a citizen. It didn't think she should go to law school. and They didn't think she should be a judge, much less a Supreme Court justice. So the whole thing, I mean, there's cognitive dissonance just shot through all of it to an extreme extraordinary degree. Um, and then, of course, Kavanaugh as well being pushed uh, 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 through there so that he would put forward, you know, their agenda. But I mean, just today, Lindsey Graham said, I saw this on social media just before we went online. Um, he has he uh, said at a rally uh, for his, I very much hope, failing senatorial campaign. Um, he's certainly being challenged. Uh, 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 he's, it's a close run thing and we should all watch it. But anyway, he said, uh, and I pulled up the quote, he said to young women, young women, there's a place for you in America if you are pro-life, if you embrace your religion and you follow traditional family structure. Otherwise, apparently, there's not a place in America for young women. I mean, not a place in America for us? Like, we just have to leave? And that's what I mean. It's citizenship. They have been. This has been the line of argument uh, since before the Civil War, since Dred Scott and going back right to the Constitution, the argument is always to try to disenfranchise people to say you're not really American, you're not really a citizen, and, and to restrict what it means to be a full citizen to a white male Christian. Yeah. Um, and, and that is, and, and the problem is the number of women exemplified by Amy Coney Barrett, who have seen that in the ways we were talking about the Irish American um, complexities of assimilation, as you said, where people see where their power might lie, and they see that that's the allegiance that can pay off for them. Um, and so that's where they go. And, and clearly, that was where women were going. I mean, we were talking just before um, uh, the event started about the way that um, that Trump has been trying to scare white American suburban women um, with uh, with the, the specter of Cory Booker moving into their neighborhoods. And for those who don't know, Cory Booker is a vegan yoga practicing, you know, it's completely a lovely guy. And basically, I, so I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and basically all of my friends and family are like, we completely want Cory Booker to move into our neighborhood and bake us brownies and teach us yoga. So it's laughable. Uh, to a lot of people, it's not funny in one sense. Obviously, the stakes couldn't be higher or more serious. But the attempts to to paint in in the kind of um, Nixonian terms that you were talking about a moment ago, to just kind of start a race riot the way that you could in 1915 by saying black men are moving into the neighborhood. Aren't you afraid, white women? It turns out it's not quite that easy to do anymore, which is good news. I mean, it suggests there's some progress, if not quite the linear um, progress that you were hoping for. Um, I do think that... Um, I think that Obama had it right when Trump won, when he said that uh, American history moves as a zigzag. Um, and I think that's right. It's not linear, but there is erratic progress being made. And um, and certainly my hope is that uh, uh, white suburban women will um, redeem themselves, from my point of view, um, in this election by showing him the door. That's certainly what the polls are showing right now. But. We'll I, I, I did love Trump shouting out at his rallies, you know, suburban women, you gotta love me. You gotta love me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, suburban women, as if, yeah. you know, yeah. A, yeah. We're, of, we're modeling you're over the corner over there, you know. Yeah, oh, exactly. You gotta love me, you get no choice, you know. Uh, yeah. But uh, I, time is moving on, I need to cut to the chase a bit. So um, I'm just gonna ask you both, I mean, the obvious questions. So can I start with you, Michelle? What's gonna happen on on Tuesday, but also what's going to happen on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? So, so what what's your sense of how this is going to play out? Because it's not just about the election, it's about who gets to vote, it's about who gets to have their vote counted, and it's about the power structure that's been built around Trump, of his judges, of his enablers, of William Barr, 
you know, all of these uh, these these power structures, which are perfectly willing, it seems to me, to steal the election. So, <laughs> not, not not to lead it on um, too pessimistic a note into you, but what, what what's your sense of where we're going to be at next week? So I think um, Sarah's point about right this being about, uh, in, in some extent, the kind of anxieties about white Protestant men, Christian men, who want to shore up power, and we need to really look at kind of voter. Uh, suppression, redistricting, all of these kinds of maneuvers that really show that anxiety about the loss of their power, right? One of the, you know, you know, my, you know, my mom will always say, well, you know, if we treated them like they treated us, like thinking about Black Americans, right? Like that's why they're so upset. Um, and you know, and I think that there's some truth to that, right? Thinking about what happens when you lose power. Um, and so I think what we're seeing, like all of my family, they're, they're at least facing two to three hour wait times at the polls. I think we're going to see record number turnout on Tuesday. Um, I think that we probably won't know on Tuesday. I, I wish that we, we did, but I, I, I suspect that we probably won't know on Tuesday who's going to be um, the, like for sure, that now that doesn't mean that someone won't call it for themselves, which is probably likely to happen. Um, but I think it, this is going to come down to what's going to happen with those mail-in ballots, what's going to happen in terms of intimidation at the polls. Like we've seen the kind of reinvigoration, especially with Biden, his um, kind of uh, co being run off the road or the attempts to run him off the road in Texas. Like people are emboldened. I know in Pennsylvania where I'm registered, they're um, boarding up banks that are because their people are anticipating unrest. And so I think that's the thing that really concerns me, the unrest leading up to this. Um, and I think that um, the U.S. is just going to be in a kind of like standstill in this kind of moment of tension until it's really resolved. And so my hope is that it happens, it happens quickly. Um, and that, uh, I mean, I will just be very transparent about where I hope Biden pulls it out by landslide. Um, and, and so that there is no question. Because I think the only way that we're going to avoid uh, that that kind of scenario that that Sarah uh, mentioned is that it has to be definitive. It has to be beyond reproach um, in, in terms of interrogating the legitimacy of it. Um, and so, so that's kind of what I'm what I'm expecting. Sarah, would you share that mixture of um, hope and anxiety? Oh, absolutely. I've never been more anxious in my life. I mean, I've like I'm just beside myself with anxiety about this. Um, and uh, I, mean, I mean, genuinely, I don't think anything has ever uh, uh, worried me more than this has. Um, I would say a couple of things for people who are equally um, anxious and will be watching um, the returns, a couple of things to look out for. Um, one, as Michelle says, is we need to be very clear that it's it's unlikely to be decided on the night and people need to go in with that expectation and um, to recognize that uh, that there will there needs to be this long slow process. They also need to recognize that that's not unusual and that the Trumps and, uh, Trump and the Republicans are trying to suggest that that's somehow a problem. It's not. It's how it's always been. I mean, remember they used to have to like bring in votes from from you know the Pony Express and like on horseback in the 18th century. Of course, it took a long time to count the votes, uh, for heaven's sake. Um, and um, and so there, there's a long time where they can certify it. The thing is, each state has. Uh, um, its own procedures for certifying its own vote. And there are lawyers all over the place. Um, and in the in the um, even in Texas, where the, yesterday they announced that they were going to try to just throw out 100,000 Democrat ballots, um, there has been a countersuit. There was instantly a countersuit, and they are suing to stop that from happening. So there are lawyers um, on the ground watching all of this, um, trying to ensure due process, trying to ensure that um, the election goes forward the way it should. The um, Trump voters have uh, indicated to all the pollsters that they are likely to turn out on the day um, in person and the mail-in ballots are breaking Democrat and the in-person voting um, is likely in, in, in many states to break for Trump. And so people are worried, they're calling it a red mirage, um, that it may look on Tuesday as if there's just red votes totting up and totting up, but it's because the mail-in Democrat votes haven't been counted yet. And that's why, as Michelle says, we need to stop any efforts at claiming that a winner has been uh, uh, um, decided. And, and we know that various journalists, um, uh, platforms, and organizations very much have their eye on this and are working to make sure that um, that they don't call it too early and that they don't contribute to any um, to any misinformation or uh, attempts to distort the outcome. But like Michelle said, there's only there's only I actually tweeted this earlier today. There's only one clean outcome 
um, which will just make it all clear, which is the obvious one, which is, a, as Michelle said, a landslide. Um, the, the, the phrase people have been using is too big to rig. And that's what we have to do. We just have to come out in absolutely historic numbers um, that they and they simply even if they do manage to throw out 100,000 votes in Texas, that that isn't good enough that it's a tsunami and they can't be stopped. Um, other than that, uh, shy of that, it is, um, as, as Michelle rightly said, it's looking complicated and ugly. And um, and I absolutely think that violence is a very real possibility as well. But um, I do hope and, and we all have to hope and trust that, that, that and to recognize that what Trump wants us to feel anxious about the legitimacy of this election, because that serves his purposes. And so we have to resist that. We have to, to not trust the system blindly, but we have to say this system can and will work if people let it be certified the way it's supposed to and make sure that these last minute attempts to throw out 100,000 ballots are not permitted and those kinds of things. And basically to stop him from taking it to the Supreme Court, which is what he wants to do. But in the United States, elections are not decided by the courts. They're not supposed to be. Um, and, and he's trying to normalize that. So it's really important that we push back against that and say that there we, we have every right to have an expectation that there will be a clear result eventually and that he will have we have to make him abide by that and as you say get his enablers out as well and then figure out what to do with them <laughs> just a couple of questions from the audience um can you please talk a bit about voter suppression and, and its history in the united states i know we've, we've covered that a bit but michelle is there anything else worth saying about or maybe actually it is worth saying just for people just to fill in the fact that voter suppression is not uh a momentary thing that might happen on on Tuesday, you know, it's it's very deeply embedded, isn't it? Right. It, there's there's a long history of voter su suppression dating back to, I mean, the late 19th century, and 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 thinking about kind of formal means through poll taxes and literacy tests through outright violence, right? So one of the first um, kind of really big uses of the historical, like the first iteration of the Ku Klux Klan, was to voter intimidate. Um, and to and to stop uh, Black Americans in this instance from voting. Um, in the present tense, it's gotten more sophisticated. So it's about voter ID laws. It's about the closing of polling stations in rural areas of the United States, which makes the post service matter a lot. And so you see with that, the, the, the kind of closure of polling stations with defunding of the postal service, which has an impact on mail-in voting. This is about, I got purged because I moved abroad. And I had my, my mail sent to my parents. And then that created this whole question of I don't, you know, I don't live in the state again. And 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 I have to say, you know, this as you know, I have an entire PhD and this was to be reinstated was one of the most difficult things I ever had to do. It involved me calling a friend who's on Zoom with the Pennsylvania office, and I'm talking to them through her to try to get this sorted out. And that was after I called 40 times just to get through. Um, you know, it, 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 it is really challenging and it can be demoralizing, but I'm really um, happy to, to really see all of these instances where people are, have really tried to follow the rules, be really persistent, um, because they put up so many barriers that I think are, are discouraging. But, I, but I've been really um, optimistic and really hopeful by what I'm seeing this year. So one thing that strikes me is um, the, the parallel in, in, with Nixon we've talked about a bit, but it, it, after Nixon was essentially forced out, he, had to, he resigned, he wasn't actually impeached, but he, he was going to be impeached there was a reasonable case to say that actually, you know what, the American system worked. The, the free press was able to investigate, uh, but critically, it was a Republican, a conservative Republican judge who, who, who ran the Watergate trials, who, who insisted that Nixon had to hand over the Watergate tapes. And it was a Republican, a, a minority, but nevertheless a significant minority of Republicans in Congress um, who came out against Nixon and said, look, this is not a party political issue. This is an issue of, of American democracy. And we were breaking party lines here just to protect the, the rights of American citizens. So you could say in, in 74, OK, it's, it's been a horrible time, but you, you could actually have some sort of confidence in the American system. It seems to me, and I, I, again, I want to know what you think about this, that, that the real delusion this time would be to say that again. The American system has not worked. You know, Trump has been impeached. His 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 criminality is it couldn't couldn't be clearer. His self dealing, the corruption, you know, you, you can name all the different levels of of, of high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, 
uh, he's been able to pack the Supreme Court. He's been able to uh, to keep absolute discipline among the Republican Party. I mean, almost none of them have broken ranks with him, however egregious his behavior has been. And this really relates to the post-election scenario for Biden. Biden cannot come out and say, you know, the nightmare is over. Uh, the, this was this terrible aberration, but our system worked. No, he absolutely can't. And um, not only do I hope he won't, I'm, I'm actually pretty confident now that he doesn't intend to. Um, at the beginning of his campaign, um, it was striking that he was talking in the terms that um, that you mentioned earlier. He was actually saying that we could kind of have a do over, that this was just an aberration and that you could hit reset, I think was the metaphor that he used. Um, he stopped using that. He stopped saying that. And I think that's uh, telling and I and I think it's not an accident. Um, and he was asked at, at uh, one point over the summer, once he had gotten um, the nomination, um, he was asked uh, at a rally by a journalist whether he would pardon Trump um, if he became president. And he said, without hesitation, I watched the video, it was fantastic. He went, hell no, right? It was just instinctive. Um, so we're not looking at a Ford pardoning Nixon scenario. Now, that's not to say that an investigation of the uh, of the Trump administration would be a straightforward thing to do, um, much less that it would um, unite the country. And of course, many people would insist that it was a Stalinist show trial and they would insist that it was a purge and that it was, you know, um, uh, just, um, you know, meeting um, corruption with corruption or they wouldn't even admit there was corruption that was being met. They would just say this is the left being corrupt like it always is and demonize the left some more. So whether in a deeply polarized uh, um, country um, you know, what the next step of trying to uh, um, ensure that this doesn't happen again, what role an investigation plays in that, I think is a really, really complicated one. It's not obvious. It's not obvious that just prosecuting him is the way forward. But I'll say two quick things about that. Again, we could kind of have a whole conversation just about that. Um, one is that the State District of New York, which is, uh, or sorry, the Southern District of New York, which is, um, so people realize, I think, that um, that a presidential pardon, even if Biden were to pardon Trump, only covers certain crimes and doesn't cover all crimes. Um, the, the crimes that the Trump um, Corporation has committed in the, in the state of New York and that Trump himself as an individual is, uh, um, that there's evidence that he committed in the state of New York. It's They have something like 23 cases ready to prosecutions ready to go against him the minute that he's out of office. And the SDNY is is an independent, they are not subject to these kinds of political arguments. Now they will get accused of playing politics, but it's a different way of doing it. So there are prosecutions that are facing him, which is part of the reason why, of course, he's clinging on to power so desperately. That's a different question from prosecuting all of his administration. And I think, but I think, you know, things like disbarring Bill Barr, but maybe not prosecuting him would be, you know, things that we could, uh, that we could think about. Um, and so there are ways forward in which we can think about this. But the other thing that we can do that's separate from the question of prosecuting the Trump administration is strengthening our democratic system uh, to ensure that this doesn't happen again, which is a separate set of uh, of uh, of acts and that you know includes restoring the uh, voter rights act the voting rights act of 1965 first and foremost it it includes um a very very important conversation about statehood for uh washington dc and puerto rico um because what that will do is strengthen the democratic system within what is effectively an 18th century republic because of course that's what our constitution is um it will push us further toward democracy because it will push us further toward a popular vote where you will have less of a disjunction between the electoral colleges and the popular vote, if you can start to uh, um, marry up the number of electoral colleges with the popular vote. So we can do things like that um, to strengthen the democratic system. And certainly all kinds of reforms are already being proposed, um, anti-corruption reforms, uh, 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 laws against self-dealing, all of that kinds of stuff. That can be strengthened if we can get um, a reasonably principled and reasonably honest administration in play. And to me, that's a nonpartisan um, position. I mean, I vote Democrat, but that's people accuse me of partisanship there. But I think that's a completely bipartisan position. And strengthening your democracy and strengthening um, um, voter turnout should be the um, the objective of any uh, um, self-respecting democracy. And that's what we have to move toward. Michelle, there's a, a, an excellent question, actually, from a member of the audience, um, which is about what if Trump loses? Um, and Actually, there's a couple of similar questions around this. If if Trump loses, where does the Republican Party go? But also, I I, I think in a way, maybe just in the limited time we've got left, 
where do his supporters go? Because I don't think they're the Republican. You know, the Republican Party to me is dead. It's it's gone. It's it's no longer exists. It's a personality cult of 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 you know a, a, a would be autocrat. What happens when the autocrat, if he's defeated? Remembering that Trump has prepared the ground for that defeat by, you know, he's been saying for months, all year, this is a rigged election. The all the mail-in ballots are frauds. Remember, this is someone who who even claimed the election was fraudulent when he won. You know, he actually insisted that he really won the popular vote. Uh, uh, but all of these illegal immigrants had 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 voted and taken his victory away from him. So we know what Trump is going to do, which is what he's not going to do. He's not going to phone Joe Biden and say, congratulations, Joe, it was a fair fight, you won. And, you know, I, I, I kiss you on both cheeks and give you my blessing. You know, He's going to be saying to his supporters, who after all are going to be well over 40% of, of, of voters, you were you were robbed. Your, your democracy was stolen from you. And what do you think the implications of that might be over the next few years? Um, I think they're going to be profound. I think it depends on what part of his base we're talking about. So I think, you know, I'm really looking forward to the scholar who really gets into like the Trump coalition, because there is this like weird hodgepodge of people who are bringing him to power. So I think that there's a kind of like a, a, a Republican that we're used to. They're going to have to, of course, reevaluate their kind of stance and what and what they're doing. And you're going to see that around kind of centering around Mitch McConnell and his ilk. Right. And that's good. And that, that the loss will be a big blow to them. But I'm so more worried about kind of like rural everyday Americans who really find themselves, their, their kind of hopes and dreams and aspirations articulated by him. I'm very worried about the ways in which we're going to see that funneled into to violence and upheaval and a kind of erosion of civility that we've already experienced. Um, there's a way in which the, the, the kind of previous eight years under Obama had driven that kind of rhetoric and idea underground. And I think that it's now out. I think it's out and proud. And I think we're going to have to contend with that for a while. And so I do expect to see kind of moments of that kind of frustration really pitched in different moments. I really, I hope I'm wrong about that because I think the only people to suffer or are minorities and women and, and people who are disenfranchised and marginal, um, but that does concern me. Uh, Sarah, just as a, as a last question, we're kind of following up on that. Um, let, let's be optimistic from, uh, you know, I, and I'm sure there are maybe are some Trump supporters watching and sorry for, you know, we're all on the same notes, but we are. <laughs> but from our point of view, uh, the three of us at least being optimistic, um, it, 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 let's assume that Biden does become president. And let's assume even that the Democrats also win the Senate, which is arguably just, just as important. Um, do they need a two-track approach? It's, you know, one is actually Biden's emollience and centrism and nice old grandfatherly thing. You know, just t picking up on what Michelle's been saying might be very important, right? Which is to actually try to be as as civil and as calm and as 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 sympathetic as possible to the losing side, but also need to start really very urgently putting in place the kind of democratic reforms uh, and also the tackling of gross inequality that might make it possible that another Trump won't arise in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I was talking about things like statehood and things. And, and as you rightly said, uh, that would depend on taking the Senate as well, not just um, the White House. So, uh, um, but it, that's, see, that's exactly my point. I mean, it was actually in, uh, it was in Dublin, um, one of the last events I did before uh, um, the pandemic hit um, in like February or something, where um, somebody asked me, you know, they had, um, they were in the audience and they had uh, uh, um, friends in America who were Trump supporters and they were saying, you know, what do we do about them? We can't, I can't change their mind and nothing I say to them gets through to them. And I said to them, this might sound flippant, but I don't know another answer. We outvote them. That's what we do. That's what happens in a democracy. And the thing is, is that those people are a minority. Now, that's not to say they don't matter. That's not to say that we don't want them to be part of the polity and that and that their point they their points of view do matter. But increasingly, where we have a country that is moving in these different directions, as you say, first of all, we need somebody who is more centrist, in my view. I actually think it was I think that Biden was the right candidate, which is not a, a very popular view 
on the left and it's a deeply unpopular view on the hard left. Um, but for exactly the reasons that you said, um, he's a safe pair of hands and people feel like he's put, put, creating at least certain kinds of normalities. The corruption, the inequality, the structural problems that we're talking about, you know, him being nice isn't going to fix. But actually, we could all just use a little bit of decency at the moment, particularly with the pandemic. Just the fact that he's actually got compassion um, is going to go a long way. And actually, I think, remind people of what the of what uh, the American civil discourse or any democratic civil discourse ought to sound like, that we are listening to each other. So what I think is, you know, we have at, at least in the short term, we have to outvote um, his supporters and we have to strengthen the democracy. And then we have to work with education, with conversation. We also have to work with the media. There's a huge systemic problem about the way in which uh, um, Fox News and um, other right-wing outlets have supported uh, Trump unthinkingly, I mean, not unthinkingly, but unquestioningly. Um, and the way that that has become a propaganda arm, the way that in the 2016 election, uh, um, he, he leveraged $2 billion worth of free media coverage, $2 billion worth. Right. That would not have happened in a system where you where uh, politics is not entertainment and where it's not on commercial television. So we have to redress those kinds of issues as well. And then we can, I hope, start to have a have a political conversation in which we get back to the idea of actually respecting each other's positions. What a remarkable idea and recognizing that we have to find common cause because that is the ground of democracy. There is no ground of democracy without common ground and we have to figure out how to find it or we will stop being the United States. And, and you know, I, I have said before and I'll say again, any country that calls itself the United States is protesting too much. Um, it is a country that has always been deeply divided and keeps trying to find ways to come back together again. Historically, we have been able to do that. Whether we'll be able to do it this time again, you know, remains to be seen. But we hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm sure, you know, people from whatever their political persuasion uh, in different parts of the world who may be watching, I think, will at least share that hope. Um, I think we've all been uh, made very aware of the fact that, you know, whether we're Irish or British or French or, or Guyanan or Kenyan or, what you know, America is inside our heads, you know, it, it, it sits there, um, uh, uh, both as, as uh, you know, an ideal and, and also for, as, a, as a living reality. Um, and I think many of us will share um, my feelings, and I presume also um, Sarah's and Michelle's, that the America that's been sitting in our heads and squatting on our brains for the last four years is is has been at the very least a source of enormous anxiety, um, sometimes a source of despair, uh, certainly a source of of, of confusion, um, and and of of um, uh, almost a kind of cognitive dissonance. You know, of, of, of trying to think is this is this actually happening or is it not? Um, it, it was, of course. Uh, James Joyce and Stephen Dedalus, who says history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. Um, and perhaps if not by Wednesday, maybe by, by Friday or Saturday, we may all be rubbing our eyes and, and looking at an altered reality and hopefully at a better reality. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to be in the company of two such absolutely wonderful, brilliant, eloquent, historians uh, who I think have illuminated so much for us uh, with such uh, generosity um, and, and, and and such a great breadth of, of, of knowledge and insight. Um, so on your behalf, I'd just like to uh, thank both Sarah and Michelle for their, their uh, superb contributions. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for, for being with us. Um, I think we're all going to be holding our breaths uh, between now and Wednesday or Thursday. Um, but we may be blue in the face by then, but hopefully we can exhale. Thank you. Thank you.